<clears throat> Welcome everybody. I'm Maureen Aylward from Town Green, and we're really pleased to have you here this evening for the second webinar in our Planning for Reality series in Essex. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at losing the high marsh, uh, ecological restoration and significant sea level rise impacts on Essex marshes, plus sediment erosion and offshore issues. We are being joined this evening by presenters Charles Waldheim and Sarah Page from the Harvard Graduate School of Design's Office for Urbanization. And a warm welcome to Dr. David Burdick from UNH. Um, <clears throat> we are <clears throat> very pleased to um, have these present presentations on the Essex Marsh. I think we're gonna learn a lot this evening. Um, we will, after the presentations, have a question and answer session, uh, and then we'll do a quick wrap up with an announcement about the field trip, but um, I will talk about the field trip right now. Uh, Jane, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, on Friday, we will have the second field trip that would be led by Peter Fippen. Um, we will be going on to the Essex Marsh and be meeting at the very beginning of John Wise Avenue. Uh, this is a little bit of a change because the tide is going to be high on Friday morning. Uh, we will meet at nine o'clock at the beginning of John Wise Avenue. We'll park there and we will shuttle some folks um, down to the area where we will be uh, talking to Peter and Peter will guide us. It's really important to wear waterproof boots if you're going to be joining us for this field trip. Uh, because of the, the higher tide. So um, let me introduce our esteemed panel this evening, uh, where I'll start with a presentation from Charles Waldheim, who is the John E. Irving Professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the Director for the Office of Ur for Urbanization. Waldheim's research examines the relations between landscape, ecology, and contemporary urbanism. He will be joined by Sarah Page, a research associate for the Harvard Graduate School of Design's Office for Urbanization, and she is the Drucker Traveling Fellow um, at the School of Design. Uh, Page's research focuses on regional planning and the design of built environment across multiple scales of community. Um, after Charles and Sarah, we will be joined by David Burdick. And Dr. Burdick is Research Associate Professor of Coastal Ecology and Restoration in the Department of Natural Resources at the University of New Hampshire, where he has taught wetland courses over the past 20 years. His study of coastal science spans 35 years, concentrating on coastal ecosystems, assessing human impacts and planning, implementing, and assessing habitat restoration at the Jackson Estuarine Laboratory where he serves as director. Recent projects include shoreline rehabilitation at sites in New Hampshire and Maine, a coastal resilience initiative to plan for sea level rise in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and measuring responses of salt marshes to rising sea level and blue carbon. So thank, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Charles and Sarah and thank you. Thanks so much, Maureen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jane, for running the slides. Um, it's nice to be back in the series. Um, for those of you that joined us last time, we'll be continuing our story around Essex and the work we're doing this year, looking at the, the biomes of Cape Ann. And for those of you that are new to the series, welcome. We'll be happy to share with you some of the work that we've been up to um, next. So a little bit about our organization. We're a small research group at the design school. Uh, the design school are architects and landscape architects and urban designers and planners and engineers. And so we're broadly concerned with the built environment. And we have uh, you know, among the research projects that we're engaged in a deep portfolio of uh, coastal climate adaptation projects in the United States. Next. We've been collaborating uh, since 2020 uh, with the four municipalities, as well as Town Green, the Water Alliance, and the Cape Ann Climate Coalition, looking at climate adaptation broadly, uh, and in this year in particular, next, 
Uh, we're focusing this year on the biomes and ecological health uh, of the, knowing that the biological and ecological functioning and health of the region will help it to both uh, build resilience, but also respond to uh, storm events and the extremities of climate change. We do this work through a form of applied design research, most often through scenario planning. Uh, scenario planning is a form of research in the climate space that's been endorsed by IPCC and a range of other institutions. And the goal is not to predict the future, but rather to build plausible scenarios that seem likely in the future in which we can begin to understand our present vulnerabilities next. In this regard, you will have already seen, or if not, we'll send you a URL link to our research resources in an online platform. Uh, we started two years ago with the development of uh, what we call a scenario zero. That is a steady state if we were to do nothing, not intervene, uh, modeling a synthetic future storm event. We know that um, you know uh, the Gulf of Maine has been spared, relatively speaking, for the past half century of tropical storms and hurricanes, but they are likely to increase in number, frequency, and intensity. Uh, and we've continued that work through uh, the development of a set of 27 key infrastructures, as well as smaller studies on net zero housing and waste recovery. Next. Next. Uh, this storm of 2038, this modeling project that we've been engaged in is the goal of it really is like a stress test if you went to your cardiologists to reveal these non-obvious, non-linear uh, vulnerabilities, especially secondary and tertiary uh, connections between systems that seem unrelated. Next. And it's important to reinforce that, you know, our work is not to make choices for the future of Cape Ann. You know, you good folks will do that. Our goal is to provide the best available knowledge, the science, the technology, the precedents, the literature to help inform uh, decision making. You can see here in this overview, this is a view from the east, from out northeast, looking back on Cape Ann, um, even though there are four distinct municipalities, Cape Ann is really one fairly small region with an extraordinarily diverse array of uh, ecosystems. And you can see here these 27 very particular sites that we've identified in our work next. And if we focus on Essex in particular, that is the Great Marsh and a series of sites around it, we know with some uh, degree of certainty the vulnerabilities that are likely to be encountered next. And in that regard, we're looking in this regard, uh, both at um, a range of factors. Uh, we're using historic wetlands uh, and areas that have been filled historically as one measure or surrogate. Uh, another measure will be our own kind of storm modeling or storm surge modeling. We'll, we'll also look at uh, FEMA designated uh, flood hazard, uh, as well as projected design flood elevations uh, going forward. And we're looking at 2030, 2050, 2070, among other time horizons. Next. And while there's great certainty that the, the seas are rising and the storms are coming, uh, the pace at which they will come is a little less clear. And depending upon which projection we look at, of course, we can imagine different timelines. You can see here in this uh, drawing, which is uh, former marsh or wetland sites that have been filled that tend to be among the most uh, vulnerable. In this regard, Essex wetlands have been damaged by development over time. And this includes a range of different historic layers. You can see in the shading of gray, lightest gray being the oldest, most historic, the darkest being the more recent. This is a practice that is ongoing. And as you'll see at the end of our remarks, uh, one of our recommendations is to stop doing this. Um, but let me hand to my colleague, Sarah Page from the office and let her uh, walk you through the work we've been doing most recently, Sarah. Thanks, Charles. Um, so we can go ahead and hit next, Jane. Thank you so much for running the slides. Um, so as Charles mentioned, the um, filling of land has greatly affected um, the Great Marsh system as a whole. Um, so we're going to focus on how development and the Great Marsh system are currently related. So you can hit next. Um, and one way that we're going to do that is by um, cutting a section drawing across the causeway in Essex. So we can hit next. Um, and we can kind of see where that cut's about to be. So next. Um, so this is looking at a um, cut across, we can see the causeway here in the center, um, the hill to the left, and then all the way down to the um, Great Marsh to the right. Um, so now we're gonna start by kind of zooming in to the left side of this image. So next. Um, so zooming in here, we can kind of orient ourselves um, by seeing that we are at the intersection of um, Maine and Martin, um, roughly around the village restaurant. Um, and we can begin to observe um, some various conditions. Um, the first is, um, so you hit next. 
Um, the first condition that we can look at is the effects of lawns and impervious surfaces within the Great Marsh system, um, where runoff and some pollutants are um, not filtered before entering marsh itself, which can cause um, damage to greater ecological systems. Next. Um, so here we're representing the um, impervious surfaces that we were just discussing. Um, next. Um, and so we're also able to see the flood zones um, in relation to development that already exists. Um, and so uh, one thing that we can see is that the FEMA flood zones predict that a third of Essex will be within that space by 2070. Um, so next. Um, so scooching over in the overall transect, we can see um, the properties that are within this flood zone will either need to be elevated or, or relocated to address that overall flooding, um, as we discussed in the first um, Essex webinar. So next, um, and additionally, that the Essex Causeway um, will need to be addressed in a similar way. Next. Um, so now we can zooming deeper into the marsh system, um, we see another set of conditions. So next. Um, one of which is um, the way the, as we discussed, like the original development that happened has happened around the marsh system is what is the cause of much of this damage. So as Charles mentioned in our recommendations, um, we begin to address that issue. So next. Um, but understanding how erosion is a part of this system relating both the Essex River to the greater marsh. Next. Um, which is also built on the uh, depth of the Essex River and the ongoing dredging efforts next, um, which we can see here. And so we can talk about the relationship between dredge, the Great Marsh, and then where that's being relocated. So next. Um, and next one more time. So finally, um, within this system, we're able to see how certain in Um, and we're also able to see certain. Sarah, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, you might want to turn your camera off and see if that helps move it out. Why don't I just pick it up from there? It looks like um, Sarah's on campus in our offices and looks like they're having some Wi-Fi issues. So apologies for that. Um, next. Um, and what we're doing here essentially is aggregating uh, all the best available studies, the best available natural science. So we've also uh, commissioned five academic advisors as well as a range of local experts, uh, many of whom are, are on the call this evening to try to gather uh, and inform our understanding of the place next. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to you know, share this material with you end of this year as we publish it next. Um, and that um, understanding of the existing conditions, you know, it doesn't necessarily you know, tell us how we might proceed, but it gives us hopefully a pretty clear diagnosis. So you know, 2070, 2050, these are uh, on the one hand, a long time from now, um, right? Uh, on the other hand, the precise pace at which we're working toward those uh, thresholds is a little bit unclear. So in this regard, we try to be you know, dispassionate and objective, um, but at the same moment, understand that individuals and institutions have already begun making choices, right? So the pressures of anthropogenic climate change, sea level rise and storm event is already evident in how real estate prices, reinsurance markets, uh, the availability of insurance products, uh, as well as governmental response, et cetera. So in this regard, especially in this region, especially uh, in New England and this part of Massachusetts, we don't imagine uh, that, that culturally something like managed retreat is a, a cultural concept that's really available here. Rather, individuals have already started to act and will continue to. Um, so in a drawing like this, what we're trying to get at are a set of um, fairly complex relationships. Um, obviously, a lot of interesting ecological and uh, bio biological habitats, a number of species here. Um, and what I want to stress here, first of all, is um, it's not simply that the sea levels uh, on aggregate or average, uh, highs or lows, are rising. They are. It's not simply that 
increased storm events will push more and more storm surge, they will. Uh, it's the ongoing building of impervious surface and the building of infrastructure into the marsh itself that reduces the marsh's capacity in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, the ability for a marsh like this to absorb uh, tidal energy, among other things, and rebound from a storm event is in large measure dictated by its size and its overall health. So anything we can do to maintain the size and the rebuild the health of these kinds of ecosystems would be a good thing, even just for us humans, not to mention all the other non-human characters involved. The second point here is that we're talking about water of very different types coming from very different directions. It's not just the salt water coming from the sea or the sweet water coming from you know, the interior inland sources, but rather in fact, um, water coming up uh, from the ground itself. Uh, this has effects both in the natural world, but also on those impervious surfaces, something that we've uh, learned quite a lot about uh, through these conversations with Jane and others. And in that context, it's not just water pushing itself up through the ground, but also impacting infrastructure, impervious surfaces. And this puts a great deal of pressure in the studies that we've done in other contexts on the relationship between individual landowners and the public realm. Uh, so for example, if you look at the case studies around North America that we're familiar with, there's often a big choice about whether individuals lead, they elevate, they relocate, they armor, they defend, and then the public realm comes along slightly later or in the case of some progressive cities and municipalities, quite the reverse happens. The public sector leads by raising roads, elevating infrastructure, elevating uh, water and sewer and electrical infrastructure, uh, defending and bunkering key uh, sites for pu public safety, like hospitals, schools, this kind of thing. Um, it's kind of an open question in our mind right now, which of those is more likely here? Uh, and obviously we've been a keen uh, interested observer of these conversations about uh, Essex and other parts of Cape Ann in terms of how things may change uh, going forward. Having said that, it's relatively easy for us to identify in a drawing like this, the places that seem to be the most vulnerable. Next. And in that regard, we have um, five, in addition to some more detailed recommendations and reports we'll be publishing at the end of the year that we'll make available to have all the footnotes and all the literature review and all the precedents and all the, all the, all the kind of academic you know, shoring up. Um, We'll share with you uh, this evening just five broad uh, recommendations. And these are, uh, again, recommendations to all actors. Uh, we know that this is a place where individuals, institutions, uh, civic leaders, governments, but also uh, NGOs, private companies will all be acting on their own. And as they do that, our goal is to share this knowledge widely and, and try to help inform their decision making. Next. So the first of these is to increase generalized public literacy about the ecosystems. Uh, and in this regard, uh, we recommend the kinds of things we're doing here this evening, this webinar, the site visit, the field trip that we've just discussed, but also more precise measurements and studies of the marsh's uh, capacity, next, uh, that has to do with sediment transport, biodiversity, uh, and in general to support any manner of activities that might increase uh, community education or the general level of knowledge about these ecosystems and their role relative to uh, life on Cape Ann. Next. Secondly, um, we would advise that we should probably stop doing practices that are quite um, detrimental to the existing ecosystems that are here. Uh, among those things would be to uh, address the existing septic systems and often these are producing highly problematic uh, conditions in the natural environment. Next. To study alternatives to that, um, we would also recommend a generalized uh, ordinance or zoning of, of banning lawn amendments. The idea of all of the nitrogen-based fertilizers, herbicides, all of this material that flows into the waterways across Cape Ann, we would recommend alternative and both local, but also more naturalized processes of landscape development. Next. Third, uh, we recommend uh, prioritizing the seeding or the development of certain key species. Next. Of course, these choices of species are a set of recommendations that are themselves quite um, you know, subjective. Um, but among them, of course, we would recommend a focus in this part of the world on eelgrass, alewives, eels, soft-shelled clams, and smelt. Um, and we have a particular interest in, um, in the uh, non-edible shellfish, ribbed mussels, and the like. Next. We also recommend um, that the salt marsh ditches, the agricultural practice used um, uh, and revitalized in the 20th century are quite problematic in that they disrupt the natural tidal flow and functioning of a salt marsh. 
Uh, we understand why they were done historically and the purpose that they were intended for, but we also find that they are an anachronism and they're a fairly uh, easy, very quick thing that one could immediately build upon uh, in this context. Next. We could also, uh, we're interested to look at and do further study on the potential for deposition to raise marshes. Um, we know that uh, in the context where marshes have the ability to migrate naturally, they will through a natural process, unless and until they reach some either geologic impediment to that migration, or they're inundated uh, with salt water on a regular basis that makes them unviable, or they encounter some physical hard infrastructure, such as a, a, you know, a dam or a, a piece of highway infrastructure. So in that regard, there are strategies and practices available for thickening and accreting uh, vertically uh, in areas where low marsh is drowning in the context of rising salty seas. Next. Um, we feel as though the general economy of shellfish in and around Cape Ann is quite robust. And in fact, sourcing that material and using it as a material resource is something we've seen elsewhere and we would certainly recommend uh, an increase of. Next. Um, fourth, and we're sort of <clears throat> building toward things that seem, you know, maybe more directly uh, probative or, or more directly actionable, which is to simply try to restore um, as much as possible the more natural drainage patterns in the region. Next. In this context, again, you can see the ways in which our infrastructural systems, our waste systems, our impervious surfaces really impede that. Next. And in which uh, trying to remove and remediate, modify as many impervious surfaces as possible. Now, you know, my friend Jane will tell you that one of the reasons we build roads this way in this part of the world is the historic freeze-thaw cycle and a historic study of uh, both salts, but also other forms of inundation. And we know that water in all directions has a deleterious effect on both the foundation and the functioning and health. Again, we're not necessarily talking about catastrophic loss here, uh, but rather the slow accretion of what's deemed elsewhere as nuisance flooding and small events that accumulate over time. So this becomes much more a question of on what basis do we want to rebuild? Like on what time horizon are we planning our infrastructure for? And doing a cost benefit analysis among other things of the value of maintaining infrastructure over periods of time, as opposed to decreasing maintenance or in fact, removing or reducing the amount of impervious surface as we've shown you, so much of Cape Ann, so much of Essex in particular has been the making of impervious hard surfaces in places that were functioning as marsh or wetland historically. And this has reduced Essex's ability to respond to climate change. Next. And of course, being mindful of <clears throat> and not looking for, nor you know, being, being being hopeful that we can avoid it, but we know that with increased you know tropical storm and hurricane event, um, the, the Cape you know and Essex have had a great a strong history of dealing with nor'easters. Uh, uh, having said that, on a regular basis in the past several years, we see flooding at quite an extreme level, risking life and property. Um, we know that Essex is at high risk of flooding, and we've seen it recently in the past several years. And so, planning both for emergency preparedness planning evacuation routes and having both on the public service first responder side, but also on the general citizenry side, a general sense of how we might be able to cope in the context of an extreme uh, or extremely uh, damaging storm event. Next. And then finally, the thing that I led with, I'll just close with an argument for, if we could please you know, stop um, converting wetlands into parking lots, uh, next. Um, this you know, seems self-evident uh, next, um, <clears throat> but is you know, a, a notoriously difficult thing. So on the one hand, you know, Massachusetts is, is gifted with um, all sorts of levels or you know, layers of good governance and uh, well-educated uh, citizenry as well as well-intentioned civic leaders. Um, we have resources, we have great institutions, uh, we have UNH, we have other organizations that are able to provide great knowledge here. So, uh, in this context, our, our observation is that in spite of all that, and in spite of many of the, the best environmental laws in the country and a progressive history of being for, for, you know, for, foresightful on protecting the natural environment, uh, often policies and practices don't align. And there seem to be historically a whole series of exceptions made at the level of just permitting, zoning, land use planning. And this is something that seems, you know, sim simple. You know, you don't, you don't need an academic to tell you to stop building in the wetland. Having said that, there are a whole series of economic and cultural and political reasons why this has been the history. So in saying this, I, we acknowledge this is not easy, 
But ultimately, our advocacy would be to rebuild the resilience of these ecosystems would be to stop building in these places and then secondly, begin to relocate development out of these places to rebuild uh, the capacity of the marsh and other ecosystems here. Next. We would also advocate for uh, consideration, ultimately an adoption of a floodplain overlay district. Um, you know, the, the more progressive way to think about this is that um, overlay districts or zoning or land use might be correlated to the vulnerability and the threat. Uh, that's often not the case in a place like Cape Ann or in a place like Essex, where land use and zoning tend to be driven historically by other issues. And so updating those uh, understandings with respect to uh, climate change and sea level rise would be among our recommendations. Next. Next. Um, and I'll just, I'll close there with saying thanks again for the opening. Happy to share this research with you. We'll put in the chat a link to our website so you can see more of this material. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Charles. Um, we're going to hear from David Burdick now. Thanks, David. Thank you. Well, this is a hard act to follow. Uh, thanks very much for setting setting up some of the issues. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the role of the marsh and the impacts to the marsh. And I have a lot of people to thank and a lot of people that work with me. So they're just listed on the slide with a lot of different institutions and agencies and NGOs. And uh, the question I was posed is, is can marshes adapt to climate change? And I think the short answer is yes, if they're allowed to, if we get out of their way. Uh, but it turns out um, we've been in their way for many years. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, salt marshes do a lot of different things for us. Uh, this is a photo from Wellfleet, uh, Mass. Uh, they create habitat. They create this landform that's a habitat for a lot of different uh, uh, secondary producers or what we call animals. <laughs> In addition to other plants, they protect us from erosion and flooding and they remove nutrients and, uh, and sediments from the water. And uh, people like to live near them and they like to live on them. They take care of themselves. They're self-sustaining if we don't mess, up, mess them up. And they also store a lot of carbon. So they're very, they're very valuable. Uh, next. So climate change threatens our marshes in several different ways. Uh, we have increased sea level and storm activity that can cause erosion, like in the, the middle uh, image on the bottom of the slide. But we also have high marsh being replaced by low marsh because of this increased sea level. So this is an image on the right-hand side of the slide you can see a lovely little plant called Salicornia is growing in this large area that used to be high marsh. And uh, it's it's probably low marsh now because I took this picture four years ago. So our high marsh is being replaced by low marsh. What does that mean? That means the high marsh can't survive there. It's getting flooded too much. It can't grow fast enough. And it can't grow fast enough, perhaps because sediments, are, it's deprived of sediments, or perhaps the hydrology it isn't what it could be. And then at the low edge, which I don't have a photograph of, I walk well, the one in the middle, I guess, is the low marsh is being replaced by mud flats. It's not really happening in that that middle that image below, but but uh, we'll see some images of that. We also have temperature increases, which can be a happy thing. Uh, the um, hibiscus shown in the picture is uh, grows up into Essex County. Uh, but not beyond that. But this photograph is from Mass is uh, from New Hampshire, where uh, this range extension may be occurring because of uh, warmer climate. But we're also losing forb pans, and these are just a little shallow areas, shallow spots on the marsh that have high high uh, plant diversity, and increasing temperatures can increase decomposition rates. So salt marshes are very complex systems. And one of the ways they take care of themselves is they build an elevation with sea level. As sea level rises, they actually build an elevation. But if the temperature is warming up, it's harder for them to build an elevation. Next slide. Another example uh, is from, uh, this is also from Wellfleet, from Stephen Smith's work, uh, Cape Cod National Seashore. 
and I'm not sure if we can, if you probably can't see my, my pointer, but in the middle, you can see there's, um, there's a marsh with green, low marsh vegetation, Spartina altiflora, and then there's a brown area, and then there's uh, more of a lighter green, and that's high marsh. And the brown area is where the high marsh has been just killed back. So that sea level rise, which has increased from 1.7 to 3.26 millimeters a year, uh, based on new satellite work, um, really indicates that we are we are losing our our high marsh. So low marsh is replacing high marsh. We have this happening in Rhode Island. We have it on the Cape. We have it in Jamaica Bay, New York. Uh, so, and in in Blackwater, in Blackwater, they're losing all their vegetation and it's turning into, into mud flats. Next slide. So will our marshes drown? Well, marshes can build up to five millimeters a year, according to some folks, and 10 millimeters a year, up to, according to other, other people working in salt marshes. It's probably somewhere between those two numbers is probably our best guess. We haven't really exposed marshes to that much sea level rise for sustained periods yet. So this global warming is a giant experiment for us all. So what are the reasons? Th so one thing marshes can do is build faster in elevation, but they have to have sediment supplies. And so for that, the tide can't be restricted, like at, um, at, the, at the Causeway Boulevard in Essex. And also marshes have to be able to move landward if we expect them to, to be able to, uh, to exist and, and survive in, in the next century. And if you have seawalls like this, the, the marsh cannot cannot move landward. So barriers to migration is a problem. And I think our previous speaker talked about that. Next slide. This is a, a model by Matt Kerwin and Glenn Guntersberg and, um, that shows a very interesting pattern. So if you look on the left-hand side, we have two, uh, three tide ranges from 0.4 meters, which is about uh, about um, a half, uh, two feet, to one meter, which is about a little more than three feet, to two meters, which is about seven feet. So we have three different types of tidal range. That top tidal range is like you'd find in Rhode Island. The bottom tidal range is actually a little smaller than you'd find in Essex. And the marsh building is something I've talked about, but they put a model in their model. They put three different building rates going from left to right, one millimeter a year, three millimeters a year, and 10 millimeters a year. Um, and these are the results they got from this, from this building, uh, from this uh, sea level rise. So you can see that where the tide is very uh, small, they've lost the marsh completely where the tide is Great, they, they keep the marsh. So this is one hypothetical result is that we get to keep our marshes. I don't think it's gonna be quite as rosy as this. So next slide. Uh, this shows uh, SLAM modeling, which is sea level uh, affecting marsh uh, model, which is uh, a very simple model that looks at changes in sea level over time and then and compares it to the range of certain plants and the upper right, uh, upper left hand side is present day, well, 2012, it's 10 years ago actually now. And the orange shows high marsh and the teal shows low marsh. And most of this Hampton Seabrook estuary just north of Plum Island is high marsh presently. But by 2060, we can see that just with a little more than a two feet of sea level rise, the whole system is really turning into low marsh. And so that's a pretty dramatic change. And this is with marsh, uh, marsh accretion at about 1.7 millimeters a year. If it creates faster, it will change slower, but it's still a cautionary tale that we may be seeing our marshes be converted from high marsh to low marsh. The next slide. And one of the things we can do is actually measure how fast our marshes are creating. And so in this Hampton Seabrook estuary, we have six locations with the benchmark sunk all the way to the point of refusal. 
we put this instrument that's on the left-hand side on top and measure nine pins in four different directions. And we can do that once or twice or as many times a year as we want. But over time, we can see that, uh, that we can see the elevation change. And we can also put out feldspar markers and look at the amount of sediment that gets placed on top. Next slide. So this is our results. So remember that globally sea level rise is estimated to be about 3.2 millimeters per year. And uh, the period of this research, which is about seven years, indicates that our marshes in Hampton Seabrook estuary are increasing. They're creating at a, an average of 2.6 millimeters a year. So we're about 0.6 millimeters um, a year lower than keeping pace with sea level. So we're losing a little elevation relative to sea level, uh, but most of the increase in sea level is offset because of the building of the marsh. And we hope that continues. Next slide. So we talked about these issues, but I didn't talk about relic agricultural infrastructure. Uh, our previous speaker talked about ditches, but there's a lot more out there than just ditches. So let's move on. Next slide. What we think about farming history, we all kind of in our back of our heads, we know from this Martin Johnson Heed painting is that a lot of our marshes were harvested for salt hay and placed on staddles, which are little wooden structures. However, that's not all of it. Next slide. You can see the little staddles in the right-hand corner, but we're gonna to move to the next slide because we only have a couple minutes left. The actual farming history is people worked very hard to create uh, large uh, agricultural systems that were systematic, comprehensive, and kept the salt water out and freshened and drained these systems so they could grow any type of food they wished. So on the one hand, in the 1800s, we're seeing salt hay and perhaps uh, some fresher grass, some English herd, herd grass being grown. And But in previous times, our ancestors were actually creating embankments and growing, uh, you know, working very hard, you know, have, uh, having intensive agriculture in these systems. This is shown even today, the, you can see the, the remnants of a, of a box. So if you look on the left-hand side, you see that little box where the water comes in and out that drains these marshlands for agriculture. And uh, on the middle slide, you can see the remnants of that box. And the fellow walking away from us is walking right toward a berm, an embankment, you don't see much of the embankment anymore, and that's because the marsh has increased in elevation with sea level rise, and the embankment itself has sunk into the marsh. And this uh, this pattern is found all over New England marshes. We found it in all the marshes we've looked at, and it was shared to, with everyone in 1826 20, by some um, some articles that showed exactly how how to do this work. Next. So why do we care? Well, we have a group called SMART Teams, Salt Marsh Adaptation and Resiliency Team, which we're trying to implement and coordinate surface hydrology. So we're trying to change the surface hydrology from being trapped by embankments and being overdrained by too many ditches. Next slide. So you can see on this on the image here, you can see there's a, a bunch of areas with water. So these areas are being waterlogged, all the plants are dying. And when those plants are dying, the surface of the marsh actually falls in elevation quite rapidly too. Uh, in the lower part of that slide, you can see an excess of ditches. So instead of soil waterlogging, this, these ditches drain the marsh too much and the soil's oxidized. When the soil's oxidized, the oxygen moves in, bacteria can break down the marsh plants, and then you also get subsidence. So the two mar these two practices, embanking the marsh for agriculture and then draining the marsh with ditches are still destroying our marshes today. It is still causing subsidence. So just when we need our marshes to be building, these, these features are causing subsidence. Next. So this is an image 1995 that shows 
even with just too many ditches, you can actually lose the whole marsh. Next one, that's 95. This is 2007. And you can see that high marsh area is now dark green. And then the last one, it turns brown because we lose all the vegetation and it becomes mud flat. So just over ditching itself can, can drown the marsh. And I'm sure you agree that impounding the water and killing all the vegetation drowns the marsh as well. Next. So back to Essex, this is a little piece of marsh just downstream. And I'm sure that many of you would think that this is a pristine marsh that's degraded, but probably hasn't been farmed. But if you look carefully at the center right, uh, center left image, um, you can see two parallel lines of, of ditches that are next to each other. And if we go back to really old photographs, uh, we can see these two ditches are next to each other and they actually have right angles to them. And so I don't know if you can see that right in the middle of the photograph, there's a little ditch coming down with a right angle. So even these ditches were farmed. So all the ditches in Essex were farmed and we have, I am busy working with the smart teams group trying to restore the surface hydrology to restore resilience by allowing these impoundments to drain and the ditches to be remediated. Next slide. We did have an unprecedented natural event, winter storm Grayson, a few years ago, and the amount of sediment it provided was about a, worth about 11 years of inorganic material laid on the marsh all at once. And it's pretty dramatic with these drone images you can see. Overall, it was almost, um, almost 200 acres of marsh had these big flat thin deposits of sediment. And so it was a great opportunity to study what would happen if you did true thin layer placement on our marshes to build them up. And uh, you know we've the vegetation came back nice and strong with only um, three inches or less of, of the sediment coming on the marsh. And uh, I think it was, we found it was a pretty positive addition to the marsh surface. But it didn't improve the drainage. And so we still have a drainage issue at this site on Jeffrey's Neck. Um, and, um, and we'll continue and in Plum Island where we had another site and, uh, and John Wise Lane where we had another site. So it doesn't matter that the sediment, we got a, a sediment load and it got extra sediment, but the, the hydrology has to be improved if we're really gonna improve this marsh. And that goes for thin layer placement. We really have to fix the surface hydrology. Uh, if even if thin layer placement's being used, because without fixing the th surface hydrology, that thin layer placement's not going to help us either. Thanks. Thank you so much, David, for that presentation. So much to um to think about. Um, I want to open it up for questions uh, right now, and. If you are able to use your reactions to raise your hand, um, that's the best way for me to see that um, that you are actually uh, want to want to have a, a be called on for a question. And you can also put any questions for our speakers in the chat. I'll be monitor monitoring that. Um, so, folks, um, first raised hand is Jane Knott. Jane, bring it. Well, David, thank you very much for that presentation. It was really, really fascinating. Um, I have a very basic question, and um, that is, uh, what is the harm? I'm, I'm sure there is a harm um, of losing the high marsh uh, and having it replaced by low marsh. You're muted, David. I muted myself immediately after my talk, so apologize for that. Uh, there's a lot of or, there's a few organisms that really focus on the high marsh, so that's an that could be seen as a negative impact. Uh, marshes, whether high or low, will reduce storm surge, and they'll also uh, reduce wave heights. But a high marsh will reduce uh, wave heights with higher water than than the low marsh. 
Um, why is high marsh? Why would I think high marsh would be important? Well, I'm not so sure it's that that critical. I, I mean, low marsh is better than no marsh. High marsh might be a little better than low marsh. From my perspective, I like to see high marsh because then I know there's marsh capital there. When I say marsh capital, there's an opportunity for sea level to rise. Let's say we have a catastrophic crack in the ice in the ice shelf and sea level rises six inches. Well, that high marsh will then probably become low marsh in a lot of cases, but it will be good, healthy low marsh and it won't be out of the tide range and it won't turn into mud flat. So it is, it's, it's sort of a, a natural, um, the natural capital that we can have to help buffer ourselves. I can add to that. David, thanks for the presentation. I, I feel like I've learned so much about uh, New England coastal agricultural heritage, really beautiful stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I, I, you know, I, in the Marine Corps, I, I learned this adage that if, if you've got two, you've got one. If you've got one, you've got none with respect to contingency and change. Um, so having two marshes is better than one, high and low. Uh, there's also, of course, the different you know, diversity of species that are accommodated in each of these places, right? So in addition to the kind of potential for mitigating storm event and sea level rise through storm event, we can also see just the diversity of the different range of you know, the flora and fauna that occupy those realms that are related, but also distinct. Thanks, Charles. Um, there's a message from Eric Hutchins in the chat. Um, Eric says, might increased winter storms be good for bringing sediment onto the marsh surface? I guess, David, that's one for you. They they might be. I think that this winter storm Grayson worked to the marsh. To disband, of course, we're talking 200 acres in a, a 12,000 acre marsh. So we, we just saw a process but we didn't see something that was going to help the whole marsh there. But an increase in winter storms, if it comes with freezing, you know, a very cold snap that freezes the top of the sediment to the ice. And then when that ice lifts, it's got a lift on a spring tide to get over the top of the high marsh. So all those things happen. Yep, that will work. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that. Um, anybody else have a question? anything at all for our panel. Give me a few moments. Uh, Jane. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't mean to dominate here, but I have another okay. another question uh, for, for David. So when you when you hear a lot about marsh restoration and typically it's it's um, changing a culvert or opening a culvert or making a culvert bigger to allow more flow into a marsh. And um, you've, you've just described um, some historical problems to hydrology in marshes um, that seem to be very difficult to, to, uh, to remedy. Um, how, how do you feel about those kinds of restoration projects of working with culverts and things like that? Uh, or, or do you think that if you don't deal with the problems of the agriculture in the past, the marshes won't survive? That's that's my first. That's question. a great okay. question. So I've been working my whole career at you know replacing the culverts and making the bridges larger and getting the salt water and sediments to the marshes because if you don't do that, they're going to have a catastrophic loss at some point. So they need the sediments and the salt and the salinity. Uh, and they do need to migrate landward a little bit. I, I don't think it's going to cost us too much in terms of land area, but it will benefit us a lot in terms of protecting what's left, you know, what the, the development that, that does occur in, on our uplands. What we found is that before you uh, go about replacing large culverts and bridges and, and allowing more water to get in, in other words, allowing for a higher water level, it would it behooves everyone to set up that surface water hydrology and get that to work first and then let it in. So we're, we're suggesting a tiered approach or phased approach where you fix the surface water hydrology, which can be fixed in just one or two years, and then allow that uh, opening to occur. In terms of the permitting and funding, if someone's really interested in a site and they're uh, working toward getting funding, 
and designs to uh, increase tidal flow to a site um, by by uh, by having another track that sets up a proper surface hydrology, you probably won't even lose very much time at all. Great, Jane, Thank do you, you have a follow-up question? Well, I, I was also going to ask, and this is kind of a, a big question. There's a lot of talk now about nature-based solutions and typ typically nature-based solutions involve coastal wetlands. Um, is this what you would recommend as a nature-based solution to sea level rise problems, let's say, to protect roads and things like that. Um, well, generally, what's your feeling about nature-based solutions for? I love nature-based yeah. solutions. Uh, I think, you know, what the what our work with in improving marsh surface hydrology, sing, what we call single channel hydrology, because we like one channel instead of parallel channels uh, to provide water to the, mar to the whole marsh surface is, um, let me get this straight. Uh, that that's working within natural processes, and so we always want to work with natural processes because that's how these marshes are going to sustain themselves when I'm gone, <laughs> which it won't be too long. Uh, but um, in terms of nature-based solutions, I usually think of those uh, protecting uh, specific infrastructure. And I know when when I look at Essex, the Essex Causeway. There's no room left to do that work. And I think it's really up to visionaries like uh, our, with Charles here to have a vision for this site. And I, you know, I think if we were sitting over, over beers right now, we would talk about how we can lift that causeway up, move some of those structures back away from those points of land and allow that flooding to occur more naturally there uh, so they wouldn't be in harm's way. And moving out of harm's way, of course, is a great way to allow natural components to protect for those really extreme circumstances of storms. I don't know, what do you think about that? That's right. In fact, one of the diagrams that we've got that we can share out is one that looks at, you know, what if individuals and institutions decided to relocate um, both, you know, where might that be available? But I think you're exactly right that the, you know, you can continue elevating causeways, you know, it's just physics, but you'll spend billions of dollars doing so. And it won't really um, solve the basic issue here, which is, you know, the, the center of the commercial life of the town is built in the wrong place. Although it's very pretty. And so if you did a build the causeway then and moved everything back, it might be nice. <laughs> it's true. And on these time scales also, you can, and there are many precedents in uh, North America of buying a half century by elevating, you know, I mean, um, we've seen, you know, a, a few steps up can do wonders. So much less a, a full story. So there's, there's still time. And I'm confident that people will be, you know, persuaded, especially as these things become more and more frequent. Thanks, Charles. I'm going to call on Dick Prouty. You have a question? Unmute yourself. I'm just wondering both for, for Charles and David, um, are there places that we might be familiar with or in New England where the stopping of development or the relocation to allow more marsh growth has been successful? And um, those would be comps. I know, Charles, you've shown us some living shoreline examples and so forth and other precedents, but I'm wondering just in ter terms of marsh and marshland and both the stopping of development, which you said is difficult, and then also just allowing more marsh growth. Where has, where if anywhere, has that been more successful than we have on Cape Ann and how might we learn from Charles, Maybe I guess Sarah that one's for you. Us. David, I'm all, I'm all ears. Um, I would say um, New, New Jersey is not exactly New England, we know this, but I would say that um, in the wake of Superstorm Sandy, New Jersey's response to the most extreme, so 
housing buyouts in the most extreme places on Staten Island would be a good precedent to look at. Um, it's not marsh specific, but it is kind of uh, vulnerable structure specific and it's done uh, at a state level in a fairly serious way. It's what, it's, that, that's where I would go. But David, I don't know if, you, if you're aware of, you know, marsh restoration projects that are more robust in New England. I don't. And I have to say, in all the literature that I've read and all the advisors that I've consulted with, I, I'm not aware of New England being, um, you know, at the forefront of these practices. There are quite a lot of them. And as, you know, as David showed, you know, they have this interesting complex history, but they are generally viewed, I'm maybe more familiar with the Wealth Fleet example. They're studied, they're beloved, they're important cultural landscapes, they're incredibly diverse and beautiful. Um, but at the same moment, I think they're generally viewed as benign to positive and therefore not a part of the problem would be my sense. David, any more further comments on that? Well, one of the things I, I like to share with people is Lieutenant's Island and the bridge to Lieutenant's Island. And it's uh, totally underwater, most tides. And people live out there and uh, they cross a little, little bridge over the Tyler Creek in their vehicles and they don't go across at uh, high tide. And uh, the, the sediments come through, the salt water comes through and it really allows the natural system to function. And I think it's a great example. Um, Eric Hutchins in the chat has mentioned Cranes Beach, which is a pretty good example where that's undeveloped. And that's, of course, the trustees of reservations have kept that fairly undeveloped in that, that system. Mm -hmm. um, Eric. Eric has another uh, question for you, Dr. Burdick. Uh, any thoughts on the current status of the Argello Road culvert replacement project 25 years later? It was one of the very first culvert replacement projects in the Great Marsh. That's true, and it's doing well. It, it's too bad it wasn't a little larger, but it's still, it's it's pretty good. I think in you know, in another decade, it will be it will have to be replaced again. Maybe even sooner than that. <laughs> Any further questions for our panel? Anything at all about the Great Marsh? Eric had another question in the chat about Agola Road. Is that what you were just talking about? Yeah, we were just we were just oh. talking about that. Sorry. about that one that road yeah okay that floods um i just wanted to make a comment uh you know you mentioned raising the causeway and then moving the structures back on the causeway but from what i see most of the structures on the causeway they can't be moved back because if they move them back they're moving them back to the the marsh so you know any raising of the causeway would also you'd have to also raise the structures so really, those structures that's, have, that's, to have to be relocated. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I, I understand that, but I didn't mean back to the marsh. I meant for the upland along Route 133, one oh, direction okay. or another. Okay, I took it that you meant moving it no. back. There's no room. No, I meant higher ground. <laughs> you know. Yeah, any final questions? Um, comments, you can still put them in the chat. Um, well, I, I want to thank our panelists this evening, uh, Charles Waldheim and Sarah Page. Sarah, it's good to have you back with us. Sorry about that technical difficulty. Um, and also Dr. David Burdick from UNH. Thanks so much um, for being with us tonight and spending time um, with our community uh, to talk about Essex and the Essex Marsh. Um, I want to remind folks that uh, the field trip is this Friday from 9 to 10. I went through it a little bit at the top of the hour, but I uh, want to just remind folks that we will meet at the very beginning of John Wise Avenue, and we will um, either walk down or we'll shuttle folks down to the end where we will be having the field trip with Peter Fiffin, and he'll guide us. Um, I'm sure that we will actually see some of the things that were discussed in um, this evening's program. We will, um, uh, 
a reminder to bring waterproof boots. That's really very important um, because the tide will be high. Um, Dick, as I'm doing my wrap up, do you have another question? No, no, good. Okay. Um, uh, so thank you to also to uh, Jane Knott and Tom Mikas for technical assistance this evening. Um, if you enjoyed our program tonight, uh, please consider making a donation to Town Green, uh, becoming a sustaining member uh, on our website. Uh, you can also make um, an annual contribution to our annual uh, fund campaign. That's on towngreen2025.org. Please follow us on social, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Uh, we will have this video available up on YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, so you can uh, check that out. And um, it will also be in our newsletter. Please sign up for that. Um, Town Green has launched Nature Wins podcast. Uh, it's syndicated on Spotify, Apple, and uh, Google Podcasts. And so I hope you'll tune into that. We'll have new episodes in November and December. And um, on behalf of everyone at Town Green and for our panel this evening, I thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Charlie. Thank